Everyone has seen the news by now that Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, the mastermind of the October 7th massacre, is dead. Israeli soldiers eliminated him last week in southern Gaza. Yahya Sinwar was one of the most evil men of our lifetimes. He was the Osama bin Laden of Gaza. The world is a better place without him. Sinwar's death is an opportunity for Hamas to end the horrible war that Sinwar started when he sent thousands of Hamas terrorists into Israel on October 7th in order to kill as many people as they could and to take as many hostages as they could. Now is the time for the whole world to pressure Hamas to free the hostages, surrender, and relinquish power. Hamas has lost the war. All that is left for Hamas is to acknowledge that it lost the war and not prolong everyone's suffering. Sinwar's death is a big blow to Hamas, but it is not the end of Hamas. Anyone who wants peace must help ensure that Sinwar's death leads to the end of Hamas in power and the end of Hamas's terrorist army. Calls for a ceasefire with Hamas are calls to leave Hamas in power. We are not going back to October 6th. Hamas was the government of Gaza on October 7th. It cannot be the government of Gaza again. Gaza can't be rebuilt with the Hamas war machine still in power. The apparent leader of Hamas right now is its former leader, Khaled Mashal, who lives in Qatar. Western countries have leverage. Qatar must be pressured to extradite Mashal to face justice and to pressure him to formally surrender and end the war that Hamas started. I need your help. Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar is dead, but 101 Israeli hostages are still in Gaza. We have a chance to get them out. The Prime Minister of Israel made an offer to Hamas that everyone should hear. He said, whoever lays down his weapon and returns our hostages, we will allow him to go out and live. Israel has offered amnesty to Hamas terrorists who are holding hostages in exchange for releasing the hostages. Here's where I need your help. I'm looking for Palestinians who have said to Hamas, take the offer. The Palestinian president, Palestinian authority officials, Palestinian diplomats, Palestinian civil society leaders, are any of them publicly urging Hamas to surrender, release the hostages, and end the war that it started? I can't find anyone. Maybe you can help me? Let me know in the comments. As I speak to you now, the war against Hezbollah in Lebanon continues. 100 rockets were fired today. It's only 3 p.m. in Israel. 100 rockets so far today were fired from Lebanon into Israel. Sirens are constantly going off and Israelis are running to their shelters. Yesterday, Hezbollah fired more than 100 rockets and suicide drones in a series of attacks. A man was killed from shrapnel in a rocket attack near the city of Akko. And one of the suicide drones targeted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's house in the town of Caesarea, which is more than 40 miles away from Lebanon. The Prime Minister and his wife were not home at the time. Despite the heavy blows to Hezbollah's leadership, the threat from Hezbollah, its terrorist army in Lebanon, remains. Diplomats from many countries are trying to end the war, but they aren't succeeding. Here is a lesson in how not to do diplomacy. The EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, said that five steps should be taken with regard to Lebanon. There's one step that's missing. Let's see if you can spot it. Here are the five items in his list. Number one, an immediate ceasefire. Number two, the rapid election of a president. Number three, the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701 and the exclusive deployment of the Lebanese armed forces in the south. Number four, a more robust mandate for UNIFIL. And number five, the delivery of needed humanitarian aid. The one thing that he forgot to call for is peace. It's really that simple. The goal is peace. Israel and Lebanon should be living side by side in peace as good neighbors. A better future is possible. The main obstacle to this peace is Hezbollah and the Iranian regime that supports it. You may have noticed that Borel didn't mention Hezbollah by name in his list. Why are so many of the world's diplomats so bad at diplomacy? If you know the answer, 
let me know in the comments. Now let's take some questions from our audience watching live on social media. Thank you, Daniel. Our first question comes from Instagram Live. There is a report that Hezbollah deputy leader Nahim Qasem fled Lebanon and is now living in Tehran. What do you make of that? Well, if this report is true, it makes total sense to me for a variety of reasons. First of all, Hezbollah's senior leadership has been systematically eliminated by the Israel Defense Forces. It's not safe right now to be a Hezbollah leader. After one year of war, Hezbollah's leaders are a target and they are feeling the pressure. So it would make sense if someone who is in effect the leader of Hezbollah wants to wait out the war and maybe go to a safer place where it's harder to reach him and that would be Iran. So from Hezbollah's perspective, it makes sense that their leader would want to escape. And from Iran's perspective, it makes sense. Some people try to downplay the link, the very strong link between Hezbollah and Iran. Well, this is a case where Iran is probably worried about losing its entire proxy army in Lebanon in this war, and it wants to preserve it. So Iran is welcoming a senior official from Hezbollah to find safety in Iran. So it would make sense from both perspectives. I don't know if the report is true, but it's very clear that Hezbollah is on the defensive, and the Israeli army is going to continue pursuing Hezbollah until the 60,000 Israelis who live in northern Israel can go home safely without the threat of rockets, without the threat of anti-tank missiles, and without the threat of suicide drones. And the war continues for this reason. Our next question uh, comes from X. Uh, it, in Iran has tried to downplay its responsibility for Hezbollah's drone attack on the Israeli Prime Minister's house. Do you think Iran knew that Netanyahu's house was a target? Yes, I do. I think it's very convenient for Iran to try to distance itself from Hezbollah. When Iran is like the head of the octopus, remember Israel is fighting a seven front war against the Iranian regime and its proxies. That's Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, terrorists in the West Bank, militias in Syria, militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, and the Iranian regime itself. Okay, we're talking seven fronts. And the one in Lebanon especially is a 40-year investment of Iran. Hezbollah would not have entered the war at all on October 8, 2023, without Iran's blessing. And much of what Hezbollah does is with Iranian coordination. There are officers of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard who are in Lebanon. They are coordinating with Hezbollah. So uh, coordinating with Hezbollah. And it, it's, it's hard to believe that Hezbollah could, so, so, could, Hezbollah could choose such a sensitive target the house of the prime minister without the Iranian regime knowing in some way. It just so happens that because the attack succeeded, the Iranian regime wants to distance itself because it knows also that an Israeli response is coming and it's overdue. We had 180 ballistic missiles fired from Iran a while ago, you remember? And Israel has said that it will respond. So we are still waiting to see what this response will look like, but it seems that Iran is not trying very hard to climb down from the tree that it climbed when it supported the war that Hamas started. And it makes total sense that Iran would have attempted to target the Israeli prime minister, and Iran should not be able to escape the consequences of its decision. Thank you for, for that, Daniel. And just following on, uh, in regard to Israel's uh, response, is it true that Israel's plans for an attack on Iran were leaked by US intelligence? I saw these reports today and it's quite disturbing. What the questioner is referring to is that there are reports that very sensitive intelligence was leaked from the American side about what Israel is preparing to do to Iran. There was all kinds of sensitive reporting about what exactly Israel is preparing at various bases around the country. Now it's very interesting that this leak would have come from somewhere in the United States and it's concerning and I hope it is sorted out. I don't know if the intelligence is true. I don't know if it's a misdirection. But the big picture is that the United States and Israel need to work together so that they can see eye to eye about a very clear, real, and present threat, which is the Iranian regime and its proxies that have chosen war. They have been fighting war for more than a year. And Iran fired 180 ballistic missiles. And Iran should expect a response to this. And the Americans should understand that Israel has no choice but to defend itself in this situation. 
And I hope that the differences between the United States and Israel can be resolved quietly behind closed doors. We have one last question for you, Daniel. It's coming from Instagram Live. Uh, the New York Times today reported that Saudi Arabia, which was open to a peace deal with Israel, is now moving closer to Iran. Is this accurate? Well, I can tell you a lot has changed in the past year. If you go back to the period of time before October 7th, we are still in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords, which was a series of peace treaties between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Israel and Bahrain, uh, Israel and Morocco, and even Israel and Sudan. There were a number of countries that were willing to normalize ties with Israel, make peace with Israel, and have normal relations like countries are supposed to have with each other. None of this could have happened. The Abraham Accords could not have happened without the blessing of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia wanted to see how the Abraham Accords would go before perhaps joining the Accords itself. And these were the discussions in the weeks and months before the October 7th massacre. There were headlines about how Saudi Arabia and Israel are very close to normalizing ties. This is one of the reasons that the Iranian axis and its proxy armies, Hezbollah and Hamas, started a war against Israel. They wanted to disrupt this normalization, this peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries in the region. And it remains to be seen if this effort to disrupt the peace will succeed. If Israel does not in any way win the war that it's currently fighting, then countries like Saudi Arabia are not going to want to partner with a loser. People want to partner with winners. And Saudi Arabia has to take care of itself and understand its own interests. And it's across just one body of water from Iran. So it's understandable that Saudi Arabia wants to feel out its options. But I think what Saudi Arabia wants is U.S. security guarantees. It wants to be in the Western security umbrella. It wants to distance itself ultimately from Iran. But it remains to be seen how this war will end. And Saudi Arabia has to take care of itself first. That's all the time we have for today. I thank you so much for submitting the questions. If you have more questions, you can find me on social media, on my personal accounts. Find me, Daniel Rubenstein, on Instagram, on Twitter. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the live daily briefing of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. We're back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Israel time, 8 a.m. Eastern. Have a wonderful day.